So hi. Uh, I am here to talk about add-ons that have their own system of plugins, or what I'm calling an add-on ecosystem. These are systems like Ember CLI Deploy or Ember Service Worker that seem to magically solve a problem for you after just installing a few add-ons and maybe tweaking some configuration. I recently started working as a maintainer in Ember Service Worker, and I was a little out of my element trying to understand how all these things work together. Uh, and as I prepared both to learn about it and maintain it, but also to present it to you, I realized that I renamed this talk. It really should be uh, figuring out an add-on ecosystem by reading the source code line by line. <laughs> Special help from Google. So I'm Lisa Backer. I'm a senior software engineer at Dockyard. Uh, I am a lifelong Muppet fan. That will be apparent. Uh, and as I mentioned, I am currently a maintainer for Ember Service Worker. But I've been in web development for almost 20 years now. And I remember before open source being a viable option for the enterprise. I remember, I see someone nodding. I remember writing software that inter, uh, interacted with kind of a black box where I had no idea what was going on, where the bugs were, how the code was intended to be used. So I really appreciate what open source has brought us in terms of transparency. Yeah, that makes me feel old. So before I go on, this is going to be kind of code heavy, and so I want to make sure that uh, anyone who is distracted by code can look at it later. This is where you can get my slides. All the code I'm going to show is from Ember Service Worker, so it's all available on GitHub as well. So since I am going to use Ember Service Worker as a kind of a one approach you can use to implement a plugin architecture, I figured we better just have a quick check on vocabulary. Uh, a service worker is just a script that runs in your browser in the background instead of being user interactive. Uh, it can enable things like offline caching, network requests, push notifications, um, all sorts of cool stuff. And for our purposes, it's important to understand that it needs to be registered by a JavaScript that's loaded uh, from a definition file. So Ember Service Worker, uh, again, a 20-second overview, just provides a framework for managing service worker code. Uh, on its own, it doesn't provide a service worker. But what it really does is compile and register custom service worker code from plugins or from your application itself. These plugins are what actually do the service worker kind of work. Uh, the, the end result of Ember Service Worker is a file structure like this with your disk that has, in addition to your regular Ember code, but also a SW registration and an SWJS file. So these are kind of the two files we're going to figure out. So I decided to get started in the same way that most implementers would get started, uh, going to the docs. So these docs show you that you can go offline first in about 30 minutes. Looks like you install Ember Service Worker, install some plugins, maybe change the configuration value, and bam, congratulations, offline first. So it says 30 minutes. I'm going to do it in 90 seconds. Uh, this is just a quick little demo, super rental site, so nothing fancy here, and showing that there's nothing installed, no service workers, no cash, nothing up my sleeves. And then I'm going to go over to the terminal and Ember install Ember Service Worker. Don't worry, this is sped up. Ember install a, uh, two different plugins, one of which is Ember Service Worker Index that handles our index.html caching, and one is Ember Service Worker Asset Cache, which caches your assets, so your JavaScript, CSS, et cetera. And then I'm going to restart Ember. Go back over, refresh the page. And we'll be able to see in our service worker here that there is now a service worker loaded. Don't need to worry about reading what's in there. It's not important. What's interesting to note, though, is there is stuff in that code that is specific to super rentals now. Now we're also going to check in our caches and see that, yes, there is indeed two ca there are two caches set up, one for our assets, as we expected, and one for our index.html. Reloading our page again shows us that we're now getting these assets from the service worker uh, instead of from our network. So ta-da, offline first. Yay. This is where most of your demos ends. This is where most of your discussion of Ember Service Worker ends. But if you actually <laughs> have to maintain this, or maybe you want to write something similar and you're looking for inspiration, or you're just curious, this is not enough. So it's time for us to study up. Um, when I am approaching something new, I like to go through in a few different ways. I like to start with making sure that I understand the vocabulary and the structural concepts. And then I like to go through any documentation that's available. And then finally, I like to start going into code. So
So what we're going to study up on, first of all, we need to know what a plugin is, because that's one of those words that's kind of like a widget. It could be anything. Um, we want to know how this registration process works. I kind of have to assume that it's going to involve configuration, and it's going to have to involve something with that registration file, but I don't know how that's going to get in the build. I want to know how we deal with plugins. How does Ember Service Worker know what plugins are installed, and how does it interact with them? And because I'm a good developer, I want to know how to test it. So starting off, what is a plugin? A plugin is a bundle that adds functionality to an application called a host through some well-defined architecture for extensibility. At least that's the definition I'm going with. Uh, what it really means here is it's something that enables developers to extend an application, to add their own functionality. Reduces the end size of the final application, of course, because you don't need to install every single plugin, just the ones you need. And the most important thing here is it provides a well-defined API for those plugins to extend. Uh, one of the things I read about that I thought spoke to me was to think of the host application as an infinite jigsaw puzzle and to think of the plugins as the pieces of those puzzles. So they have to be the right shape in order to fit into the puzzle, just like your plugins have to implement the right API. Then I had a revelation that an add-on is a plugin. A plugin is an add-on. This is not an unfamiliar concept. Uh, Ember add-ons implement a well-defined API from Ember itself. The plugins, in this case for Ember Service Worker, implement an API defined by Ember Service Worker. So this is not magic. So let's move on to our next goal, configuration. We wanted to look at how we could deal with that registration file. So if we scroll down in our configuration docs, we find that there is a section on registration. Don't need to read it all, but suffice it to say that you have um, an, a default value where you can include a file, or you have uh, some other things you can set to do like inline code and such. So and to figure out how to do that, I went to the docs, of course, to the add-on docs. Uh, Ember CLI docs have improved a lot this year. The learning team has done a great job and put a lot of effort into this. Uh, so I really commend that, and that's, I love to see where that's going. <laughs> yeah, they deserve it. <laughs> that makes this worse. However, <laughs> when you go to write like build add-ons, it does get a little thin. So uh, then we're back to our old friends, the API docs, which aren't quite so pretty. Uh, they are from the code, though, so they are complete. Sometimes more than you can hope for. So as I mentioned, Ember provides a well-defined API, and that is through hooks, right? So here's a, through your API, you can get a listing of the hooks available for add-ons. We want to read configuration. We want to include files. So searching through, I decided that the good place to start would be the included hook. Uh, this basically lists its uh, accepted uses or possible uses as being configuration and vendor files. So definitely looks like where I'm going. Another good thing to do is to see how other people are using code, especially if you're not unfamiliar with an API. Uh, this was actually shown earlier today, which is great, because it's a really useful tool, and I don't think as many people take advantage of it as they should. Uh, you can use the code search in Ember Observer. In this case, I'm going to go through and look for the included hook and see how people are using it. When you get your results, you can sort them by uh, rank, which also gives you the ability to deal with the more established add-ons first. You can see a quick snippet, and you can even deep look directly into the code, which is really what I'm interested in, right? So I get in here and see that there are some, some things about options, there are some things about vendor files. It definitely seems like I'm on the right track. So now, it's time to dive into the code. So here's the whole included hook. Don't read it all at once. Uh, <laughs> the first thing I'm going to do is I see some stuff about fingerprinting. That's not what I'm interested in here, so I'm just going to get rid of that. And then I'm going to start at the beginning. We got a reference to the application options. What are these? Well, these are the options that get passed in when you are creating a new application for the, the build of a new application, and we're getting this from the docs again, of course. Uh, but you've also all seen this because this is what you see when you create a new application in your blueprint uh, Ember CLI build file. So it even says right there, add your options here. Next, I'm going to get a reference to the Ember Service Worker options. Uh, you may think this is defined because Ember Service Worker is the name of the add-on, but that's not actually the case. Plenty of add-ons use different names here, so it's important to check your docs to know what you should refer to. In this case, it says Ember Service Worker. 
now we can finally get into looking at the configuration values. We've got our registration strategy. We can see how we could easily set a default. And we can take advantage of anything in the build time to do this. So we can look at, uh, for example, what environment we're in. If we're in a test environment, we may not want these things. Or any system level va uh, values that we may have defined by node. And then finally, we import our registration, load registration script file. So where is this coming from? It says it's in the vendor directory. Vendor, as, as we probably know, is a place where we can find our assets that aren't maintained by NPM, so our JavaScript, CSS, et cetera. Uh, so I'm just going to pop open the vendor directory. No big deal. There's no vendor directory in Ember Service Worker. <laughs> so where is this coming from, actually? Uh, let me search the code. That's my next step. And I find a reference to that same kind of file in a function called tree for vendor. Uh, but I don't know what tree for vendor does either. So back to the docs. It says it returns a tree for all vendor files. <laughs> that, that clears it up. <laughs> uh, I can go up a little farther and see that there's a whole bunch of these tree for hooks, and there's slight more information here. At least it tells me that it's combining a tree of some type with the application, but I'm, I'm still a little lost with this definition. So I've been around Ember at least for a while here, and I, I do understand that generally when we're talking about trees, we're talking about broccoli. So I'm going to go to Google and look for broccoli trees. <laughs> My favorite thing here is this is real. It says people also ask, is broccoli real? <laughs> <laughs> Scrolling down, it doesn't get any better. Um, no reference to broccoli.js in here. Uh, but I have looked at the site before, so I'm just going to pull it up in my browser history. No big deal. Um, yeah, that's, that was gone, too. Uh, <laughs> but I know there were these great tutorials because there was an awesome pre-conference workshop last year and this year uh, by Ellie Griffiths. And so I went searching for that and found a great broccoli tutorial. I highly recommend this as far as being a nice step-by-step -step guide to walk through and see how broccoli interacts with Ember as it's being built. Um, so from that, a few takeaways. Broccoli trees, they're not trees. Uh, it's actually, they're called broccoli nodes now. This has been a while, but the, the language still exists in a number with trees. Uh, it really just represents a file or a set of files that you can manipulate and return a file or set of files. You manipulate it with a plugin. Uh, again, back to the plugin architecture. Um, each plugin has a function called build. That is its well-defined API. Broccoli really is the tool that just puts it all together so we can end up with our final output. Uh, one of the more newer ways I've seen to explain this is this, this tree graphic here where you actually start out at the top with your application and chunk it into different sets of files, run your transformations on them like SAS, et cetera, and eventually come down to the trunk of the tree with your final build output. And I should mention that since I did my research, there is now a Broccoli documentation site. It's just not in the same location. It's in broccoli.build, so you get the benefit of that. So back into the code we were looking at. Uh, in tree for vendor, it's writing out an actual file. That file is being included in the tree. Uh, so that's why we can find it in vendor, and that's why we know it's there in the included hook because we wrote it ourselves. We should also kind of note that the, in that file, we're including a, a script that is loading SW registration, and that, that was in our initial uh, listing of the file output. All right. We got through two study goals there. That was pretty good. Uh, we, we understand like the concepts of plugins. We understand a little bit about like how we can read configuration, how we can do files. We haven't actually talked about plugins at all, though. So we should, we should do that. I actually just did a search in the code for the word plugins to find it. And this is kind of what I found here is a reference to a function that says find plugins for. Uh, it's in a hook, I should have mentioned, in a hook there called post process tree. So I went to the docs for this one, and of, of course it says that it post processes a tree. <laughs> so rather than get mad or anything, I mean, it is open source. I could just like crack it open and figure it out. But um, at least at this point, we understand basically what a tree is, post is after, this is after processing the tree for the build. So back into our find plugins, uh, just to see what that does. It calls a few uh, utility functions that are custom. But generally, it's looking for any add-ons that have been set for a, uh, an application that have the Ember Surface Worker plugin keyword. And that is the keyword that is defined in your package JSON. 
Um, so this is a nice standard way to look for uh, add-ons that have been installed, and it's used in other systems like the beginning of the tech detection for Ember CLI deploy as well. So we've got our plugins. Uh, we have a list of plugins that have Ember Service Worker plugin. We're also going to add that into this list, um, our current application, because our current application might want to implement Ember Service Worker's plugin as well. So that way, the person doesn't have to write a plugin just to have their own service worker code included, the person being you. Uh, the next thing we do with that is call something custom called a service worker builder, and we're passing in that list of plugins we have, as well as the app tree and some other options. Um, we're going to go into that, but I just want to show you the very next line, which calls a function called build, which looks suspiciously like that broccoli API. We call it twice, once for a service worker and once for a service worker registration. Keeping in mind, those are the two files that we were looking for at the very end. So we might be getting a dip, uh, a bit deep into Ember Service Worker here, but I promise I'm going to stick with the plugin stuff and not go headway into the Service Worker stuff. With that said, though, we should have some clue what this API is that we're looking to implement, right? So the API that Ember Service Worker provides is does two things. One, it looks for uh, a well-defined folder within the add-on, uh, and it also gives, generates a, a tree for, or allows calling a tree for hook, similar to the tree for vendor we saw before. It does this for a service worker. Uh, so the folder would be something like this, the root and the service worker folder. And it also does it for service worker registration. <laughs> So back in our code, this is the whole service worker builder. There's a whole bunch of stuff in there. Uh, what we're going to look at is the build function, though, because that's what we're talking about. Uh, so when we call build, like I said, we call it once with service worker and once with service worker registration. To make that a little, oh, and what we're going to do is look at all our plugins, loop through and call a callback, basically, for each plugin that we find. Uh, so going into that specific tree for plugin, this is now being called for each plugin that we have in our array of plugins. And just to make it a little simpler, let's assume that we've called it with service worker and not have to look at those extra variables. This is like a good way to try and break down code that might be, seem a little complicated at first. So we start off getting a reference to that path that we're looking for, right? The service worker folder within our plugin and also understanding what API method that we're looking for, the, in this case, tree for service worker. Then we're going to check and see if that path exists. Uh, if it does, we're going to create a tree from it, and we're going to hold on to a reference to that tree. Then we're going to look and see if that method exists. If the plugin has that method, we're going to go ahead and call it with the trees that we created. Finally, that output we're going to return. Uh, in kind of a namespaced name. So that remember, it's the plugin's name and then slash service worker. We're doing that with a broccoli funnel, and Google told me that a broccoli funnel is something that allows you to take a subset of files or just move files around in our case. So that was trees for plugins. So what we've done is gone through, we've done that for every plugin that we found. Next, we have to compile them because this is in post process, so we've already done our compilation steps. Similar to before, we're going to assume that we're doing this with the service worker call, so we don't have to worry about those extra file names there. Uh, but we are calling it with SWJS being the file name we want to end up with at the end. So here's compiled trees, not as long. Starts with an entry point. So I know I'm going to have to go into another file. I know. <laughs> we're going to get back out to the top again, I promise. <laughs> the full entry point file. Uh, Good thing to note here is that this really is a Broccoli plugin. This one implement, uh, extends a Broccoli plugin. So that means we're gonna, we know two things. We're going to have a constructor that gives us uh, all the input and all the trees we're starting with, which in this case is that plugin trees that we generated, uh, and some options, the file name we're looking for. And we're going to have a build function. The build function is what implements the Broccoli API. So in here, we're just going to get a, we're gen, gen, generate some JavaScript uh, based on running through the plugins. And for each plugin, we're going to look and see if there is an index.js in there, we're going to include it. Uh, we're going to write some, sorry, we're going to write some code out, which basically looks like this. It's a bunch of import statements, uh, one for each plugin that actually has something importable. And this is how we're going to make sure we have a reference to our code later, and we're going to also be sure that it doesn't get shaken out 
which I'll get to that in a second. Finally, we're gonna write this all out in a file and return it as the uh, return tree. So we've got our entry point, we've got all our trees for our different plugins, we're gonna merge them all together. Again, Google tells me I can, this is calling broccoli merge trees, this is just merging trees, there really isn't a lot of documentation to say there. Finally, we're gonna do some cleanup work. We're gonna run Babel to transpile and make sure that we can run it in our target browsers. We're going to call rollup to create that SWJS, and we're gonna minify our code and return it all back. So now we're out, back out at the top again at the index.js inside our post process hook. Now we have done that for both the service worker and the registration, our two APIs that we implement. And finally, we're gonna merge it all together with the application and return it which gives us this output that we were looking at at the beginning. So, that all the, the most code heavy stuff is done now. <laughs> uh, I did kind of gloss over a few things there, but so I figure in case you, you were wondering what those are, uh, just a quick review of Babel is something that we use to do transpilation. So making sure that your code can run in various browsers that you target, uh, including polyfills if you need to, and Babel is also an ecosystem of plugins. I also said rollup real fast. Um, rollup is something that handles dependency injection and making sure that we have all the code we need together into whatever output we specify. Uh, it is, also does something called tree shaking, which means removing the code that you're, you're not gonna use, essentially. And Babel is also an ecosystem of plugins. So finally, I said I wanted to figure out how to test all this. <laughs> so I go and pull up the test folder, and it doesn't actually have what I, I was hoping to see either. Uh, but <laughs> looking through it, I find that there are other test folders, and I realize that this is not like testing a normal Ember application. Uh, this is testing the build for an application. So it's testing a node, and when this was written, that also meant that it was testing a Mocha. Um, which again meant I was way out of my element. But I've been doing testing for a while, and so I understand that there are some things that I need to make sure are tested. Uh, I need to make sure that there are unit tests, of course, for my core functionality. I need to make sure that the host, so Ember Service Worker in this case, actually uh, calls the MPI when it's supposed to, and that it can handle getting weird input because maybe the plugins didn't implement it right. The plugins should test that they actually implemented it right. <laughs> Uh, and both of them need to test that they're actually affecting the build in the way we expect. So how can we test affecting the build? Well, Broccoli is its own ecosystem. Uh, Broccoli provides its own, some tools, and there is a Broccoli test helper uh, package available that provides a few helper functions to make it easier to test our build output. So just a quick example, not a lot of code, I promise. Uh, we pull in Broccoli test helper, and get a reference to a helper function here called create builder. And then this is just kind of a simplified version of a test that's on that same service worker builder code we were looking at before. Uh, it starts by generating some mock plugins so that we can pass them in, which we then pass into service worker builder, uh, and wrap that with our create builder helper function. So now we can actually call build on our helper instead of directly on our, build, oh, on our builder. And from there, we can read the output, we can test that our files exist in there, we can test that the uh, output of the file is what we expected it to be. So what did we learn in all this? Uh, first of all, plugin architecture is just a fancy way of talking about what we already know how to do. And Ember add-ons implement a plugin architecture via hooks uh, and can provide their own API for other add-ons to implement as well. We learned that Brackley, Babel, Rollup, they all implement a plugin architecture. It's a great way to work in the open source world. And none of these things are scary, um, but they are usually a little more complicated than the hand wavy demo that you see at your local meetup. <laughs> we can take advantage of this to write our own ecosystems, of course, uh, for all sorts of uses, not just service workers or deployments. And finally, uh, just a few words. I mentioned at the beginning, I really do enjoy being able to read the source. Um, this is you know, a benefit of what we're living in right now. And while it would be awesome if the documentation covered every answer, it would be great if the maintainer was available at 3 a.m. on Discord when you had a question. That's not always gonna be the case. 
So you can open up the code. You can read the code. It's not that scary. Just go step by step and use Google as much as you need to. And with that, I'm Lisa Backer. This is Esha DC, everywhere you would care to find me. Uh, feel free to talk to me afterwards, and thank you.